Well, it is, in, it is incredibly encouraging uh, to be able to worship with so many believers. And um, it's just over 10 years ago, right before I moved to Japan, that people in this chapel at Ozark Christian College prayed that Japanese people would be impacted by the gospel. And last week, at our church place, that you would be impacted by the gospel right now. Because gospel impact leads to mission. And so to that end, would you please open up with me to the book of Romans? And I want to read Romans 1, 1 through 5, and then the doxology at the end, chapter 16, verse 25. So the very beginning and very end of the book. It says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. And now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Pray with me. Father in heaven, I pray that today you will help all of us to see your gospel clearly. I pray that we could see the glory of the cross. I pray that we will all be dedicated to your mission, your mission for all nations, for the sake of your name. I pray, God, that today after chapel, people will talk about what I said and not how I did. I pray that in conversations around campus today, there will be conversations about the gospel and its implications. Father, please impact us with your word right now. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I feel one of my tasks is to call each of you to leverage your life for world gospelization. I have prayed that I could compel each of you to leverage your skills, your time, your money, your prayers, your connections, your students, your congregants, your children, and for some of you, your place of residence for world gospelization. And to compel you to leverage your life for Christ's worldwide mission, we're going to go to Paul's letter to the Romans. Why? Come on, missionary boy, why aren't we going to Matthew 28, where's Acts 1, Psalm 67, Jonah, Isaiah 6, something like that? No, Romans. Why? Because as we read, Romans begins and ends with all nations. It begins and ends with all people coming to faith in Jesus through hearing the gospel and coming into a life of obedience to God, obedience that comes through faith, the obedience of faith, as it said in chapter 1, verse 5 and 16, verse 26. Romans is a missions book, and Paul knew that the way to call people into missions for the nations is to give them theology, give them the gospel. Among Paul's objectives in writing this was his goal of calling the Roman church to leverage their lives for world gospelization. Paul knew that much of the world did not live in the obedience of faith, and I've lived in 
a country for 10 years now that has very little faith in Jesus and therefore very little obedience to God that would spring from that faith. Japan is 1% Christian, 0.2% of the people there go to church every Sunday. 88% of the people do not know a Christian. There's one church for every 16,700 people in Japan, if you're wondering what in the world does that mean. There's one church for every 800 in the United States. Once again, there's one church for every 16,700 people in Japan. The average church size is 35 people. 60% of the churches there are less than 15 people apiece. So if Joplin had the same ratio of Christians to non-Christians, same ratio of churches to people, here's what Joplin would look like. In all of Joplin, there would be 500 Christians. There would be three churches, but not all 500 would be attending. Remember, it's only 0.2% of the population in church. So there would be two churches in Joplin with 15 people apiece, and then one mega church of 70 people. And if that was the place where you grew up, would you have heard the gospel? And would you have been drawn to a Christian life without all of the social incentives that we enjoy living in a Christianized society? There is very little obedience of faith in Japan. Orphans are disregarded, 85% live in institutions. It's reported that there were less than 500 adoptions last year. Materialism reigns supreme, sex outside of marriage is normal, sex within marriage is rare. The sex industry in Japan accounts for 2% of the GDP. Families have deteriorated without any examples of families living according to God's design. The birth rate is declining, abortion is on the rise, no one seems to connect the two problems. Depression and suicide are rampant, there's more money spent on pornography per capita than charitable giving per capita, and ancestors and false gods are worshiped in every neighborhood and in most homes. But this is not Japan Focus Week. This is International Focus Week. Thailand has a huge need for the gospel. And Bangladesh contains the largest unreached people group. Post-Christian Europe in the northern corners of the United States of America, they have a huge need for church plants. There are 7,000 unreached people group people groups, and 1,300 unengaged people groups. These are all places where the gospel needs to be preached for verse 5, for the sake of his name among the nations. We do all of this for Christ's glory, nothing less. Paul had his eyes set on the unreached and unengaged. You can look in chapter 15, verse 20. He says this, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. This reminds me of my next-door neighbor, and our houses are about that far apart. My next-door neighbor, Keiko Tomoda. And when we moved in, we became friends. Um, She has a couple kids that are high school and college age, but my wife and her became friends and they they started hanging out and my kids, you know, like to to play and hang out with Aunt Keiko and she started coming to church with with my wife. She started writing to church with her uh, every week and so every week she started hearing the gospel, more and more gospel into her life and then just over two years ago, Keiko was baptized and she told us, she said this after she had been baptized, If you had not moved in next door to me, I would have gone my whole life without ever hearing about Jesus. We want to preach the gospel where Christ has not been named. We want to be a witness where there is no witness. As Paul said in chapter 15, verse 23, I no longer have room for work. In these regions, getting a little stuffy with all these Christians around, so I'm coming to you, Rome. And not only that, I'm headed to Spain, and I need your help taking the gospel there. In chapter 15, verse 24, he asked for their financial support in taking the gospel to Spain. And then in chapter 15, verse 30, he asks for their prayer support. So look, I know what this is. This is a missionary support letter, okay? I've, I've written these things. He's asking the church in Rome to leverage their finances and their prayers for world gospelization. In chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, about that gospel, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. 
For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The gospel, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. The righteousness of God, meaning both. One, God's righteous character, his justice. In chapter 2, verse 16, it's going to tell us that part of the gospel is that God will judge. That's an aspect of the good news, that there's judgment coming. And the righteousness of God also means the way God makes us righteous through faith in Jesus is how he makes us righteous, just like verse 17 says. And he backs this up by quoting Habakkuk. The righteous shall live by faith. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 11, Paul used the same Habakkuk text to argue that, the, that we are justified by faith. And he's using the Habakkuk text to make the same point here. here. He'll also use the story of Abraham to make the same point in chapter 4. So the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. And it tells us of God's righteous character and how God makes us righteous through faith. Or how he's going to summarize in chapter 3, verse 26... The gospel shows us that God is just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. John Stott says this, he says, He is eager to preach the gospel in the capital city of the world because in the gospel, God's righteous way of righteousing the unrighteous has been revealed. This gospel is the power unto salvation, and Paul is about to unpack it in worship-inducing detail in the book of Romans. And through this letter, Paul will help the Roman Christians and, as Bart says, all men of every age know what we believe as Christians. Read Romans to know and believe the gospel. Result, mission. Paul says, hey, Roman Christians, here's the gospel that we believe. Because you believe this, help me take it to Spain and the world. So here's the DT. Here's the big point. Here's the main idea. Here it is. To the degree that we believe the gospel, we will leverage our lives for world gospelization. To throw fuel on their mission's fire, Paul taught the gospel. In Ozark Christian College, to throw fuel on your mission's fire, I think we need to believe the gospel more. I'm going to ask you to believe two things from Romans today. Number one, that God is just. That all people are guilty of sin and under God's wrath. Paul will spend the next few chapters saying what he summarizes in chapter 3, verse 10. None is righteous, no, not one. And to show this, he speaks of several categories of people who are unrighteous. Primarily, Paul is talking about both Jews and Gentiles that stand guilty before God, but he's also saying, you know, those without the law, those with the law, those who think of themselves as righteous, those who don't give righteousness a second thought. Today, I want to focus on two aspects of these groups of people. There are A, those without special revelation and b those with special revelation we say there are those with and without special revelation as opposed to general revelation which is available to all people general revelation is natural always occurring always observable fitting with the normal order of creation general revelation includes things like sunsets and newborn babies and butterflies and seasons and crops for food and the fine-tuning of the universe the human eye things that you can see god's glory in creation the general revelation is spoken of in chapter 1 verse 18 he says for the wrath of god is underline a few words for me okay The wrath of God is revealed, and revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is underlined plain, is plain to them, because God has shown, underlined, shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been, underlined, clearly perceived. Ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. All people everywhere know of God. That's what verse 21 says. Those without special revelation of the prophets and the Bible and and the apostles and Jesus and the preaching of the word through the church, they all know God. And look at how easily they know God. Look at those words you underlined. 
Look at how apprehensible God's glory is in creation. Verse 18, revealed. 19, plain to them, shown to them. Verse 20, clearly perceived. It's not hard to detect the designer's fingerprints on his creation. And then chapter 1, verse 32, not only do they know God, they know his righteous standards. They know his righteous decree. So, the unengaged tribesmen and the estimated 95% of the Japanese people who have not heard the gospel can walk around and see God's design in their world and his provision in their lives, and they should think there must be a creator, some kind of being to whom I'm accountable. Verse 18 reminds me of a man in Osaka named Yoshio. This guy came around our church when he was about 67 years old. He he was um, walking around outside of our church building one day when I walked out of the church building, uh, out of my office, and I saw him looking at an Easter poster on the wall. And so I started talking with him, and I said, hey, have you ever been to a church service? We're having, you know, Easter's coming up. We'd love to have you come. I gave him a little invitation. I invited him to come. Sure enough, he came to Easter. Not only did he come to Easter, but he started coming to every service after that. And so then he joins in and we start this series through the gospel according to John because even though we're in this unreached people group, expository preaching, it's powerful and it's effective. That's what we do, right? So we're in John chapter 1 and he hears me preach and say that in, in verse 12, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And I looked out as I say this, And this 67-year-old man's cheeks are just soaked with tears because he's crying because he hears that God wants to adopt him. A few weeks later, the then 68-year-old Yoshio was baptized. And before he was baptized in a seeker's class, he was talking with one of the guys I work with, a guy named Seth Phillip. And he said, he said that, listen, he said, I always knew there was a God. In seeking, he had actually gone to a cult group. And he said, halfway through the meeting, it was super weird, and so I left. (laughs) But he's seeking, and he's seeking, and there's no witness, and he can't find a witness. And then finally, an Easter flyer comes his way when he's 67 years old. Understand, knowing about God was not enough to save him. He had to find a witness. And how many people, how many more people have to go 67 years without being able to find a church that can be a witness? And how many people are going longer than that and dying without ever running into a witness of the gospel? Next in chapters 2 and 3, Paul will also point out that those with God's special revelation are also guilty. Having the scriptures, having the law of Moses, having the outward sight of the covenant does not make anyone innocent before God. Chapter 3, verse 20, no one is saved by works of the law. We cannot make ourselves righteous. Neither those with special revelation nor those without special revelation live up to God's standard. Read chapter 2, verse 12. It says, for all who have sinned without the law, no special revelation, will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. So the kid who grew up in Bangladesh without a witness, without a Bible, and then lusts or gossips or lies, he has broken God's law, he stands condemned. And the kid who grows up in the Bible belt with Sunday school and parents reading him the Bible and and, and going to CIY and FCA and an abundance of Christian resources in English and then gossips or lusts or lies has broken God's law and stands condemned before God. Chapter 3, verse 10, none is righteous. No, not one. So we looked at pagan Gentiles, the self-righteous Jews, those with special revelation, those without, the flagrantly unrighteous, the self-righteous. Did you see yourself in there anywhere at all? In chapter chapter 1, he gives a little list. Verse 29, he says, They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness. What kind of unrighteousness, Paul? Well, evil, covetousness. Ever coveted anything? Like anyone's car, 
Anyone's dorm room? I wish I, I wish I had that dorm room, not the dorm room across from the bathroom because everyone brushes their teeth in my room. I wish I had that dorm room. I wish, I, have you ever coveted anyone's boyfriend, anyone's girlfriend? Malice, they're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit. Any deception ever happen? I didn't read 100% of the book, like 80%, but I'll just write down 100%. Maliciousness, they're gossips, slanderers. No exegesis needed on the words gossipers and slanderers for anyone to feel convicted. Haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. If that didn't get you, jump over to chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. Ever judged? (laughs) For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same thing. So every time that we say, well, they should have, or they ought to, or they said, what, can you believe they posted that? Every time you do that, you're, you're setting some kind of standard to which you will inevitably fall short. What about what Paul says to the biblically literate Jews who want to teach others? Surely we can find some common ground with people wanting to teach others the Bible. He talks about this group of people in chapter 2, verse 17 through 24. Just look at 21 and 22. He says, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? Are you torrenting a movie in your dorm room right now? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has committed adultery with her in her heart. Pornography is akin to adultery. You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Well, you understand, I'm like a college student. Nobody expects college students to tithe 10%. Nobody expects that. Do you rob God? We know the sin in ourselves. I live in an honor-shame culture, which doesn't mean nearly as much as some people want it to mean, but it does mean that people have an aversion to personal guilt of secret sins. And if the sin is known, they feel shame, and they want redemption. My co-laborer in the gospel, a guy named Yuma, did not see the relevance of the gospel until he came to believe that he himself was a sinner. He thought the cross was just some very weird Western religious idea. And then once he came to believe that he was a sinner, then the cross became life to him. Do you believe, number one, that all people are guilty of sin and under God's wrath? Wrath. An unpopular idea right now, but long before William Paul Young and Michael Gungor and Brian McLaren didn't like the idea, chapter 3, verse 5 shows us that Paul was at least familiar with people being uncomfortable with God executing justice. He says, what should we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. And if you look over Romans, you're going to find that anyone with a problem with wrath has a fight with Scripture. Chapter 1, verse 18, God's wrath is revealed. Chapter 2, verse 5, because of unrepentant hearts, people store up wrath for themselves. Verse 8, those who reject truth follow and follow evil get wrath. Chapter 5, verse 9 says Jesus saves us from the wrath of God because we are actually in danger of it. Want to go outside of Romans? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, we are objects of wrath. Want to go outside of Paul? John 3.36, whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Listen, God's wrath is not like human anger. It's not a moody temper. It's simply our holy, just God's reaction against sin in his creation that he loves. Sin is revolting to him because he is good. God is just. We don't want a God who tolerates evil. Once again, John Stott is really helpful. He says, the alternative to wrath is not love or kindness. The alternative to wrath is neutrality in the moral conflict. It's apathy. And an apathetic judge is not a just judge. So here's a question. How many people is God obligated to save? Is God obligated to save 
anyone? Does he have to make a way for us to be saved? No. The, the story of human history could have been uh, God created, man sinned, God sent a flood, the end. It, the story of human history could have been God created, man suppressed the truth about God with unrighteousness, take out that cross of Jesus part, and then judgment day comes and all of us are condemned. And as every human passed before God, we would all receive the guilty sentence from the judge, and that would make him a just judge. That would make him good. An umpire's job in baseball is to call balls and strikes accurately. Imagine that two pitchers play each other and both throw nothing but unhittable strikes. And so the umpire calls them all strikes, eight innings, Double no hitter, all strikes right down the plate. And then imagine the umpire, he starts to feel sorry for the hitters, you know? And he says, I want somebody to score. I want somebody to at least get on base. And so four pitches come right down the plate at 108 miles an hour, and the umpire calls nothing, but he calls ball, 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 ball. He wanted to be loving, so he called a strike a ball. Is that loving? Is it nice? How would the crowd react? They'd scream for his job. They'd say, get this guy out of here. This guy's blind. The umpire wouldn't be a nice, loving umpire. He'd be inconsistent. He would be compromised. Nobody would call him good at what he does. But if the umpire calls strikes, strikes, then he is a good umpire. And God calls it right every time. And if he were to condemn 100% of humanity, he would be a good judge, accurate, fair, just. All of us get up to the plate and God calls strike. So what are we to do? I actually brought something with me today. This is... Um, this is my crime file right here. This is, uh, this is every sin, a written record of every sin that I've committed right here. And uh, you, do, you don't want to read this, all right? It gets pretty nasty. You really don't want to look into this. Uh, and understand, this is, this is just a visual representation of a written record of every sin that I've ever committed because this is what we call a sermon prop, okay? If, if this were an actual, if this were an actual written record of every sin that I've committed, we'd just have filing cabinets lining the stage filled with files. What would be written in here for you? I know that right now the Holy Spirit convicts you and you know what would be in your file. See, we all believe that we are guilty and that we stand condemned under God's wrath. And do you know why you feel so confident that you are a sinner deserving of God's wrath? you know why? Because you know yourself. But why are we not so confident that that hypothetical sweet old lady in the unengaged people group who might be a pretty good person is a sinner? Why are we not so confident that they're a sinner and under the wrath of God? Do you know why? Because you don't know them. And if you knew them like God knows them, if you even knew them like you know yourself, you would understand that they are guilty of sin and under the wrath of God. No one is righteous. Can you imagine the grace of God if God made a righteous way to righteous the unrighteous at great cost to himself? The second thing that I need you to believe today is that God is justifier. All people are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Read Romans chapter 3, verse 21. It's so fun to read. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. 
All who believe. Can you imagine God's grace if he said, okay, I'm going to save one of these people? You're like, well, you don't have to do that. That's amazing grace. And it, you know, if, if it was a bigger number, if you just, he said, I'm going to save 237 people. At great cost to myself, I'm going to make righteous 237 people. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's amazing grace, but it doesn't say that. It says, for all who believe, we receive the righteousness of God. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation, an appeasement of his wrath by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness. Because in his divine forbearance, he passed over all of those former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just. Every sin is punished and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. His wrath comes out justly on all sin of all time. We're justified. Through faith, we receive the righteousness of God. Philippians 3, 9, Paul says... I want to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Not a righteousness of my own, but as Luther says, an alien righteousness that's deposited into my spiritual bank account. I'm in Christ. I have his righteousness. Isaiah 53 said that Christ would make many righteous. And one of my favorite verses, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I've got another file here. This is Jesus' file. And if we open this thing up, you're going to see it's just pure righteousness right here. And here's what happened on the cross. All of my filth, all of my sin, he who knew no sin became sin and he took all of this and he absorbed the wrath of God for everything I did and everything you did and everything all of us have done. He took the wrath of God in our place. And then what happens to me if we have faith in Jesus? What happens to us? This righteousness of God is then deposited right into our account. Here it is in our file. This, his story becomes our story. And now when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin. He looks at you and he sees his son. He sees the righteousness of God. He sees his child who's adopted, who's an heir, who's completely perfect and totally loved and all of that salvation and eternal life is ours by God's grace through faith. Do you believe that? Friends, our only hope is Jesus. We only receive this salvation through faith in Jesus. Do you believe the good news? Do you believe it enough to leverage your life in such a way that the world can hear it? There's a building in Osaka called the Sky Building, 173 meters up. Not as tall as others because we have earthquakes there. But I like to take a lot of people there. And from the top, you can see uh, all 19 million people in the Osaka uh, metro area. As you can look off to the west, there's the Osaka Bay. And right next to the bay, there's uh, the city of Kobe is over there. And then uh, to the north, east, and south, it's ringed by mountains. The northeast, there's Kyoto over there. And the, the water and the mountains ring in all 19 million people. 1% Christian, 95% have never heard. You see, it's one thing to say, I believe the gospel at 1111 North Main. people, people, people. And do you still believe there? I took a team Thank you, sir. 
I took a team up on top of the Sky Building, including one Ozark Christian College graduate. And I asked this team, like I've asked a lot, I've asked a lot of others, the 99% of the 19 million people that you can see right now, what happens to them when they die? And this diploma-carrying Ozark Christian College graduate didn't wait long to respond. They said, well, who knows? I don't know what salvation looks like for them. I know what salvation looks like for me, but for them, it might be something else. So at least one sat where you sit and sat through four years of chapel and did not believe it. I hope it's the only one. But if you don't believe the gospel, you don't believe the world has need of the gospel. And you won't go and tell, and you won't send and pray, at least not to go and share the gospel. No belief in the gospel means no mission to gospelize the world. So right there at the top of the sky building, we opened our Bibles to Romans 1 through 3. And we learned that all people are guilty of sin and under God's wrath. And all people are saved by faith in Jesus Christ and only Jesus. As John 14, 6 says, Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then the apostles in Acts chapter 4, verse 12 said, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the only hope. We must trust in him. And I believe that for a sinner like me, and I believe it for the whole world. When I stand before Jesus, I will not be saved for being relatively good. We won't be saved for being ministers. We won't be saved by going to Bible college. We won't be saved by being preachers or missionaries or Bible translators in the jungle or martyrs. On that day, when I stand before God, there is one thing in life that will have saved me, and that's calling out on the name of Jesus. I must call on his name, on his work, on his death, and his resurrection. He's the only way. He's the only remedy. He's the Savior. All people must call on Jesus to be saved. But how are they going to call on him of whom they have not believed? And how are they going to believe of him of whom they've never heard? And how are they going to hear without someone preaching? And how are they going to preach unless they are sent? Maybe you're supposed to be sent. Let me pray. Father God, you are so good. You are so gracious. Thank you, God, for saving us through Jesus. I thank you for the way that you've blessed my life, that I'm saved, that you allowed me to go to another country and learn a language and be able to share with people who've never heard. And I pray, God, that more resources and lives will be leveraged to share your gospel with the world, I pray that you'll move people to structure church budgets in such a way. I pray that you'll move people to pack up and leave and move people to pray hard for those who are over there. I ask God for one in this room who is not going to go plant a church 
Among those who have never heard, I ask that you will change their course, God, today and compel them by the gospel to go and share. I pray that you will give people wisdom to understand if they're the part of the body that should be sent. And God, we pray that your name will be known. Yeah, we pray that all people will worship you and glorify your name so that you will win a great victory. God, we want you to be glorified. And Lord Jesus, we pray that you come. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.